Well, good morning, everyone, and good morning to everyone at home. We'll be continuing this morning with our studies on the kings of Judah, and today we'll be talking about Jehoshaphat. Before we do, let's just pray. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. And we pray, Lord, that following the study this morning of the life of King Jehoshaphat, that we come to realise what a great and awesome God you are. We've been singing about your greatness, Lord, and now in your word today, we will see something of your greatness in action. And we pray, Lord, that that encourages us to see your greatness in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, just in case you think I'm operating without notes this morning, I'm not. I just had them hidden, that's all. <laughs> and as you can see up there, the story of Jehoshaphat covers 1 Kings 22, which is more of a summary of his uh, deeds. And the other is... Second Chronicles chapter 17 to 20. Now, if you like, I can read them all, or we can just talk through, give a summary of what they say, together with certain <coughs> extracts from the scripture. Now, firstly, Jehoshaphat the man. The name Jehoshaphat means Yahweh has judged. He was the fourth king of Judah following the division of Israel into the northern and southern kingdoms. Of course, that came about through the ineptitude of Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. Jehoshaphat reigned from 873 to 849 BC, but he was co-regent with his father Asa for three of those years. Among his reforms, he strengthened Judah against aggression by fortifying and placing standing garrisons in the northern towns. His father had conducted a campaign and he'd recaptured a lot of those cities up there uh, towards the north and uh, he'd sort of started it. So Jehoshaphat carried on there with fortifying the cities he eradicated much of the pagan worship, removing the high places and the Asherah poles, the symbols of Baal worship and fertility rites. But unfortunately, he didn't completely clean them out, but he did get rid of many of them. More importantly, he adhered to the law of the Lord. He ordered his life according to the law of the Lord with a couple of little slips here and there. He also provided itinerant teachers, Levites and priests, to travel throughout the land and to teach the people the law. You see, un unlike us, we, we all have a Bible. At least I hope we do. We have a Bible to which we can refer and we can read the word of the Lord. They didn't. It was all in scrolls which were kept either in the synagogues or in the temple. And they got it piecemeal. They got a sermon, a reading and a sermon every Sunday. And that's all they got. Here he instituted an actual teaching program where they went out, gathered the people, sat down and they went through the law and they taught it to them so that the people had a better understanding of what it was that the Lord uh, desired of them. He also reorganised the legal system of judges in key cities with a court of appeal to Jerusalem. It's quite an interesting legal system, actually. It was, in a sense, akin to ours. You had lo local courts to district courts to supreme courts with the appeal court in Jerusalem. So it was quite a good system. 
it also meant that the king didn't have to decide on every case. In 2 Chronicles 15 verse 8, tells us about Asa extending his control northward. So it was just a natural continuation for Jehoshaphat to follow on. There's no specific number of the troops that were stationed in these fortified cities. But we do know from history, from the Lachish letters as they're known, and they're from a later period, there was regular correspondence between Jerusalem and these outposts and they had a whole signal system of signal fires to ward of any impending danger. 2 Chronicles 17 verses 1 to 9 introduces Jehoshaphat's reign. And Jehoshaphat his son, that's Asa's son, reigned in his stead and strengthened himself against Israel. And he placed forces in all the fenced cities of his Judah and set garrisons in the land of Judah and in the cities of Ephraim, which Asa his father had taken. And the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the former ways of his father David and sought not the Baalim. In other words, <clears throat> all the kings were compared with David. Jehoshaphat walked in the ways of David. In other words, he walked in the ways of the Lord. He sought the Lord God of his father and walked in his commandments and not after the doings of Israel. Therefore, the Lord established the kingdom in his hand and all Judah brought to Jehoshaphat presents and he had riches and honour in abundance and his heart was lifted up in the ways of the Lord. Other versions say he delighted himself in the Lord. Moreover, he took away the high places and the groves out of Judah. Also, in the third year of his reign, he sent to his princes, even to, and then there's a list of names, ben Hale, Obadiah, Zechariah, Nathaniel, Micaiah, to teach in the cities of Judah. And with them he sent Levites, another list of names, Shemaiah, Nethaniah, uh, Zebediah, Asahel, Semiramoth, Jehonathan, Adonijah, Tobiah, and uh, I guess the next one is pronounced something like Tob Adonijah. Anyway, you can see him there. Levites, and with them two priests, Elishama and Jehoram. And they taught in Judah and had the book of the law of the Lord with them and went about throughout the, all the cities of Judah and taught the people. Now that's not a bad thing to do. And that's one of the reasons why Jehoshaphat is nominated as one of the good kings of Judah. He had a standing army. It was a conscript army. And it was actually exactly twice the size of that of his father Asa. And it's calculated that he had well over a billion men in that army. Its divisions into clans follows the pattern that's found in other levies. And looking beyond the large numbers, the army was established in terms similar to what we have. They had, well, we'd use the modern terminology. They had platoons, they had companies, they had battalions, they had divisions, and then they had brigades. In other words, it was a structured army. It wasn't just a great bunch of ragtags who carried a sword and went out and did what they wanted to. There was a structure to it. So we can see that Jehoshaphat was a leader who liked structure. In 2 Chronicles 18, we read there about a certain marriage alliance. And 18, 1 says, Now Jehoshaphat had riches and honour in abundance and joined affinity with Ahab. Now Ahab was a nasty pasty married to an even nastier pasty named Jezebel and he was the king of Israel. 
And so, I guess to put a bit of background to it, the wives or the ancient rulers usually represented political alliances through their wives and their concubines or the wives and concubines of their children. And it was not uncommon for the son of a ruler to be married to the daughter of another ruler and that gave a political alliance between those two. Well, that's what Jehoshaphat did. And his son, Jehoram, was married to It's a nuisance hell, isn't it? The fingers don't work. <laughs> His son Jehoram was married to Athaliah, who was the uh, daughter of Jezebel. Now that had an effect on people around Judah. The Philistines and the Arabs then brought tribute to Jehoshaphat. Why? Because they could see that now Israel at least appeared to have come back together again, which meant that they were stronger. So the Philistines and the Arabs brought uh, goodies to Jehoshaphat so that he wouldn't hopefully go out and attack them. In other words, they paid tribute to him. But that association with Israel through Athaliah, who was totally pagan after her mother Jezebel, almost proved Judah's undoing after the death of Jehoshaphat. Now, I'll give you a little bit, but Alan will take this a lot further next week. 2 Kings 11.1 1, When Athaliah, the mother of uh, Azariah, Ahaziah, saw that her son was dead, he became king a little later. She arose and destroyed all the seed royal. But Jehosheba, the daughter of King Joram, sister of Ahaziah, took Joash, the son of Ahaziah, and stole him from among the king's sons which were slain, and they hid him, even him and his nurse, in the bedchamber from Athaliah, and so he was not slain. And he was with her, hid in the house of the Lord six years, and Ataliah did reign in the land. Her name, Ataliah, actually means the Lord is exalted, Yahweh is exalted. But in fact, anything but, uh, the Lord was anything but exalted under her as she reigned in Judah for six years and made Baal worship the official religion of Judah. That all came about after Jehoshaphat's death and after the death of his son uh, Jehoram. But it was set up because of the alliance between Jehoshaphat and Ahab. You know, you, you simply can't get involved with people who've moved away from the fundamentals of the faith you can't join with them in any sort of common venture. And of course he did. Well, a little bit earlier than that, in 2 Chronicles 18.4, it continues, And Jehoshaphat said unto the king of Israel, Inquire, I pray thee, at the word of the Lord today. What was that about? They joined in their alliance for war against Aram. Now, Aram is a biblical name for Syria, and sometimes Syria and Aram are used alternatively. Therefore the king of Israel gathered together of prophets 400 men and said unto them, Shall we go to Ramoth-Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And they said, Go up. For God will deliver it into the king's hand. But Jehoshaphat, who, as we've been saying, was a godly man, 
said, Is there not here a prophet of the Lord besides that we might inquire of him? He wasn't too happy about just listening to 400 prophets of Baal. He wanted to hear from a prophet of the Lord. And the king of Israel said unto Jehoshaphat, Yes, there is one man by whom we may inquire of the Lord, but I hate him. He never says anything good about me. Always evil. The same as Micaiah, the son of Imlo. And Jehoshaphat said, Let not the king say so. And the king of Israel called for one of his officers and said, Fetch quickly Micaiah, the son of Imla. And the king of Israel and Jehoshaphat, king of Judah, sat either of them on his throne, clothed in their robes, and they sat in a void space at the entering in of the gate of Samaria, which was the capital of uh, Israel. And all the, prophecy, uh, all the prophets prophesied before them. And Zedekiah, the son of Shenaniah, had made him horns of iron and said, Thus saith the Lord, With these thou shalt push Syria until they be consumed. And all the prophets prophesied so, saying, Go up to Ramoth Gilead and prosper, for the Lord shall deliver it into the hand of the king. And the messenger that was sent down to pick up Micaiah, who apparently was in prison, spoke to him, saying, Behold, the words of the prophets declare good to the king with one assent. Let thy word, therefore, I pray thee, be like one of theirs, and speak thou good. In other words, he probably had a soft spot for Micaiah because, of, you know, when, when the prophets prophesied before the kings, and we need to realise this, they put their life on the line. If the king didn't like what they said, it was literally off with their head. I didn't like what you said, so off with his head. See, it rhymes. And being a prophet of the Lord was a dangerous business. And they had to have tremendous faith in the Lord that he would protect them. And if they were to die for him, they were prepared to do that too. But they would speak only what God told them to speak. Which is what Micaiah said. As the Lord liveth, even what my God saith, that will I speak. And when he was come to the king, the king said unto him, Micaiah, shall we go to Ramoth Gilead to battle, or shall I forbear? And he said, Go ye up and prosper, and they'll be delivered into your hands. You can almost hear him saying it with a mocking tone in his voice. And the king said to him, How many times shall I adjure thee that they say nothing but the truth to me in the name of the Lord? In other words, Ahab was smart enough to know that Micaiah was having a lend of him by saying the same thing as the 400 prophets. Then he said, this is Micaiah again, I did see all Israel scattered upon the mountains as sheep that have no shepherd. And the Lord said, these have no master. Let them return therefore every man to his house in peace. And the king of Israel said to Jehoshaphat, did I not tell you that he would not prophesy good unto me but evil? Yeah, didn't like what he heard. Again, Micaiah, again he said, Therefore hear the word of the Lord. I saw the Lord sitting upon his throne and all the host of heaven standing on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, Who shall entice Ahab king of Israel that he may go up and fall at Ramoth Gilead. And one spoke, saying after this manner, and another after that manner. Then there came out a spirit and stood before the Lord and said, I will entice him. And the Lord said unto him, Wherewith? In other words, how will you do it? And he said, I will go out and be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And the Lord said, 
Thou shalt entice him, and thou shalt also prevail. Go out and do even so. Now therefore, behold, the Lord hath put a lying spirit in the mouth of these thy prophets, and the Lord hath spoken evil against thee. Well, I don't think Ahab would have been too happy to hear that. Then Zedekiah, the son of Cheniah, came near and smote Micaiah on the cheek and said, Which way went the Spirit of the Lord from me to speak unto thee? And Micaiah said, Behold, thou shalt see on that day when thou shalt go into an inner chamber to hide thyself. And the king of Israel said, Take ye Micaiah and carry him back to Ammon, the governor of the city, and to Joash, the king's son. And say, Thus saith the king, Put this fellow in the prison and feed him with the bread of affliction and the water of affliction until I return in peace. And Micaiah very nicely said, If thou certainly return in peace, then hath not the Lord spoken by me. And he said, Hearken, all ye people. In other words, ye have all heard it. If he comes back in peace, the Lord didn't speak through me. He doesn't come back well. You see, throughout the ancient world, it was believed that prophets not only proclaimed the message of deity, but their proclamation actually activated the prophecy. In other words, when a prophet spoke something, it was believed that in speaking it out, they had activated what they'd spoken. It's no wonder that a prophet negatively disposed towards a king must somehow be controlled, lest he bring about all sorts of havoc. Well, the upshot of it was that the two kings went out with their armies and Ahab disguised himself as a, for want of a better term, a common warrior, so he would not be readily identifiable as the king of Israel. And Jehoshaphat went out in all his legal, regal robes. Now the Aram, the Syrian strategy, was that while the infantry was absorbed in hand-to-hand -hand combat, the Aramean chariotry was specifically targeting the king of Israel. You see, chariots had a specific role in military engagements of that era. They might take a charge into the infantry to cause a bit of havoc in the first place, but their job after the initial charge was to circle round the battle and keep the parameters tight. In other words, the, anybody tried to run away, well, they, they took them out. But they were to circle round, and in this case, they had a specific task. Find King Ahab and kill him. Well... They saw this guy there in all these royal robes. They started to pursue. Then they realised it wasn't Ahab, it was Jehoshaphat. So they said, oh, he's okay, so they let him go. Okay, so Ahab is safe. Is he? There was a stray arrow just floating through the air that pierced a joint in his armour and mortally wounded him. Dear, oh dear. The wiles of men can never frustrate the purpose of God. God had purpose that Ahab would die in that battle. And he did. Or he died from the wounds in battle. A supposedly stray arrow probably had the hand of the Lord directing it. And from that, I guess, if nothing else, Jehoshaphat's experience should warn us that those who are leading God's people must never enter into partnership with those who've abandoned the fundamentals of the faith, no matter how statesmanlike or magnanimous such a move may appear to be. In other words, no compromise. Now we have floating around in the world today this World Council of Churches. 
and the World Council of Churches is very ecumenical and very inclusive and all that sort of stuff. And they accept any faith into this World Council of Churches to pray together. No, that's, that's moving from the fundamentals of the faith. That's allowing false gods, false religions to come in and join with what is said to be Christianity. That's Jehoshaphat and Ahab all over again. They've abandoned the fundamentals of the faith. And there are some in the Council of World Council of Churches who are possibly feeding them Christians. But they're compromising their faith. Never do that. In Galatians 1, verses 6 to 9, the Apostle Paul wrote to the Galatians, I marvel that you were turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel, which is not another, but there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven preach any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you've received, let him be accursed. Those are pretty strong words. But Paul is reinforcing that principle. No compromise with anyone that's moved from the fundamentals of the faith. The next bit I'd like to talk about <coughs> in Jehoshaphat, we are talking about the greatness of God before. Consider this, chapter 20. 2 Chronicles chapter 20, verses 1 to 37, and I won't read the lot. But verse 1 says, it happened after this that the people of Moab with the people of Ammon and others with them beside the Ammonites came to battle against Jehoshaphat. So he's got this huge army coming towards him. They're coming up from the Dead Sea way. We've got Moab and Ammon. They're located east of the Jordan River. They're the offspring of Lot. And they've got Edom with them as well from the south. And they're the offspring of Esau. And they've got intentions of dethroning Jehoshaphat. They'd come around the south end of the Dead Sea as far north as Engedi, which is at the middle of the western shore. Actually, it's a, it's a beautiful place. It's got waterfalls and spring-fed pools and everything. It's no wonder David set up camp there when Saul was chasing him. It's a beautiful place. The rest of it around it is desert and rugged hills and the Dead Sea. But this way they're coming, that was a common route for enemies to come because until they actually came up the the road from uh, Jericho, they were hidden from Jerusalem by the mountains around Jerusalem. So they weren't easily seen in that sense. But they know they're coming. And in verses 7 to 13, Jehoshaphat's prayer, he reminds the people that the Jews were his covenant people. See, when he's praying, he's not really reminding God, he's reminding himself and he's reminding the people who are listening to his prayer. He's saying, Lord, we're your covenant people. This temple, which is where he was praying, is your sanctuary and the place where you promise to hear and answer prayer. And those to whom Israel had once shown kindness are now coming to destroy her and take away her land. And Jehoshaphat closed his impassioned appeal and with all Judah they stood before the Lord 
waiting for the answer. Now, he's got a pretty serious sort of a crisis on his hands. But he's waiting for the Lord to tell him what to do. In other words, he's, he's controlled his fear. See, fear is an enemy of faith. I've heard people say fear is the faith of the devil and I, I guess there's some truth in that. Is It's also a little acronym that says, you know, fear, F-E-A-R, is false evidence appearing real. And very often people get frightened of things that aren't real, things that haven't happened. They get concerned about what might happen and 99% of the time it never happens. So their fear and their worry and their anxiety was all for nothing. Anyway, Jehoshaphat is waiting in faith. And the Spirit of the Lord spoke through Jehaziel, dispelling the fear that had gripped the nation. The crux of the message, the battle is the Lord's. In other words, the battle belongs to God. The people had only to go out the next day and see what he had done. So by faith, the people then rejoiced in their victory even before it came to pass. The Lord has said he'll look after it. And they accept it in faith and they're rejoicing because the Lord said he'll fix it. Hasn't been fixed yet, but the Lord said he'll fix it. So they're rejoicing. And the next morning, they were up at dawn to see what the Lord had done. They marched to the battlefield as though they were going to a festival with the singers leading the way. Note that God had said only to go out. Jehoshaphat added that the singers should lead the way. What were they singing? In verse 21 in uh, one translation says, As they went out before the army, they were saying, Praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. Others say, Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. For his Mercy endures forever. I believe they were singing Psalm 136. And what I'd like to do now, it's a responsive psalm. What I'd like to do now is go through a couple of verses. I'll give the statement. I'd like you to give the response. For his mercy endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His mercy endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. To him who alone does great wonders. To him who made the heavens with skill. To him who spread out the earth above the waters. To him who made the great lights. And so it goes on. And as it goes through the whole of the psalm, it details all of the miracles that God did bringing Israel out of Egypt. And the response was always, for his mercy endures forever. They've got leading out of Egypt. They've got crossing the Red Sea. They've got providing manna. They've got the battles they fought to get into the place. You know, it's all there. It's a nutshell history of the greatness of God in bringing Israel into the promised land. And so... 
when they get to where this army is, what do they find? God had confounded the enemy, possibly when he heard his people singing their song of faith. He stirred up the opposition so that they fought and destroyed one another. When Judah arrived, the only thing left to do was to collect the source boil. And that took them three days to pick up all the goodies. There's an awful lot of bodies lying around. And I guess there's an awful lot of goodies they could pick up as well. How many died in that massive army that was coming? Don't know. But it was the fighting men of three nations. Moab, Ammon and Edom. God destroyed the lot. Or they destroyed each other, but uh, God worked a miracle. Israel never had to take a swipe of the sword. With unbounded joy, and understand that, they praised the Lord and returned to Jerusalem singing. Now the neighbouring countries, they took notice of this. And Judah enjoyed peace. Now don't go up against that mob. Their God will clean you up without any trouble at all. So Judah enjoyed peace. Now the site of the battle is the valley of Baraka. And Baraka means blessing. So it's the valley of blessing is where the battle took place. Then we find, as is customary, a summary of the reign of Jehoshaphat is given in those uh, verses, 31 to 34. Despite his efforts, he was unable to completely stamp out idolatry. But on the whole, his had been a good reign. He sought to do good, and even though he wasn't perfect, he usually did what was right in God's sight. But, as Alan mentioned a couple of weeks ago, he started well, he didn't finish well. Oh, you might think, oh, yeah, but he has so far. No, no, look what he does next. 35 to 37. This is a postscript. Jehoshaphat's partnership with Ahaziah, the wicked king of Israel. He's still compromising. They made ships at Ezi and Geba to travel to Tarshish, but the Lord wrecked the project as announced by the prophet Eliezer, who said to Jehoshaphat, ah, ah, you put, a wrong, put your foot wrong this time. He was 60 when he died. His son Jehoram, who had been his co-regent for five years, succeeded him on the throne. And of course, he was married to Azaliah, Jezebel's daughter. So what can we say about uh, Jehoshaphat as a leader? A leader can delegate anything except responsibility. Your leaders simply can't give away the responsibility of leadership. They can model it. They can teach it. They can share it. But ultimately, the buck stops with the leader. And Jehoshaphat was a good leader. The buck stopped with him. And he was a good leader because he referred to the Lord. If it wasn't to the word of the Lord, it was to the word of the Lord through a prophet or by praying to the Lord and waiting for an answer. He was a good leader. As we could see, he faced a crisis. Three armies are coming against him and he had the same options that we all do when we're faced with a crisis. We can give up, we can back up, or we can stand up. And it's in those times when you're in a crisis that you find the quality of your leadership. 
Jehoshaphat came through with flying colours when he was faced with a crisis. And then finally, what steps did Jehoshaphat take? Well, he fought his fear and he stayed calm enough to think. He sought the Lord. He wanted God's perspective by seeking his wisdom in prayer. He didn't act alone. He gathered the people and informed them of the issue. He listened for the voice of the Lord until he knew what to do. Then he embraced the word of the Lord and formed a plan. The Lord gave him the basic plan, go out and see what I've done. And Jehoshaphat added a bit to it. He said, I'll send the singers out first. We'll sing your praises for the victory before the battle. And then he taught that plan to the key players, to those that were close around him and to those who were the leaders of the singers and the musicians and his military officers. He told them what the plan was. He didn't just say, go out and see what the Lord's done. He told them what the plan was. So they knew what they were going to. And he got the victory. He followed God's plan with precision and he succeeded just as God had predicted. Lord, we thank you for the lessons that can be learned from the life of Jehoshaphat, that he relied upon you and you, Lord, gave him the victory. And in Christ, we too have that victory. We have that victory over sin. We have the victory over temptation. We have the victory over the adversities of life. Not by anything of ourselves, but through Christ Jesus, who is the way, the truth, and the life, and the only way to you, Lord, as Father. Amen.